All right, so the next level is the host tier two. And as we've seen this before, the host tier two sits below the tier one and it really incorporates the core tenets of tier one into a chosen core technology. So what are the current tier twos available? Um, there's the OpenVPX 4.0 that's publicly released. The 4.1, as we mentioned before, is currently in distro D, and you can get that by contacting PMA 209. And essentially, what the OpenVPX tier two does is it defines a subset of acceptable modules and their interfaces from OpenVPX. Um, there's also a PC 104 version 1.0, which focuses on smaller form factors where it standardizes um, some of the power, um, some mechanical cooling approaches, and gets into, re writes, rewrites the requirements from PC-104. Both were selected from trade studies, and for example, the small form factor trade study, and I looked at the size, what type of functionality they support, multiprocessors, does it support a RTOS, how rugged they are, and a main thing looked at was COTS vendor diversity, making sure that there are multiple vendors that supply these COTS components. You can pick a, a COTS technology that only one vendor creates and it's not really open. You're still gonna be stuck to going back to that vendor. So you need to make sure technology select, there's a wide market for that. So what does a PC-104 tier two contain? Well, if you were to read the PC-104 standard, it's, um, it's a very natural language. There's no specific requirements you can point to. It does describe the system, it does describe the hardware, but you can't say requirement one does this, requirement two does that. And so a major thing that host did is it took that ambiguous natural language and put them into a requirement syntax. So now you actually have verifi verifiable requirements that can meet. Um, it went to go a step further in recommending a standardization for power connections. It requires a CMTI now, so some type of hardware management to be done with the PC-104, which wasn't required in the current standard. And there are some gaps that are still need to be addressed that host is working towards, and that's with regards to the cooling, how to do conductive cooling. Um, multiple cooling methods can make the interfaces between two modules uh, incompatible, so we're trying to standardize on a cooling method as well. And then the second one is um, the VPX standard, and this one is on currently a version 4.1. And so really to understand the VPX standard, you need to understand VPX and the Vita standards that are involved in it. So I'm gonna go through some of the major ones. So the first one to understand is the VPX standard, Vita 46.0. And what the VPX standard defines is it defines the physical size of the modules and also the connectors that need to be utilized. So it really defines that form factor and backplane interface. Um, the pictures below, it shows on the left the 3U form factor VPX module. In the middle, there's a 6U form factor VPX module. And then VPX defines these, what they're called wafer connectors. And this is how the modules and the backplane interface with each other. One thing it doesn't go into is what signals go on which pins. So at this point, it's only defining the form factors, really, in Vita 46. Uh, there are some minor definitions for certain specific control signals, but out of the hundreds of pins available, uh, very few are actually defined. So just using Vita 46, all you have really is a form factor and connector. Next, um, they. The next step was to then standardize how do we put different protocols, different signals on these wafer connectors, and that's where Vita 65 kind of comes into play. And what this Vita 65's goal is, is to find a standard way to say which signals go on which uh, pins, which connectors. So they do this in two ways. One way is a slot profile. And so in the bottom left, that's considered a Vita 65 slot profile, and if you are You'll see these a lot when you go through the OpenVPX standard. And so there's different colors. And the main colors are the yellow, which is a data plane. That's for high bandwidth distributed communication, such as your main mission data. Uh, there's, you'll see blue blocks, and that's expansion plane. 
And those are for high bandwidth communication from a more of a host to peer type topology. So like your single board computer to your graphics card, direct communication. While the data plane is more of a distributed communication through some a network switch, for instance. And then you have their control plane. That's the green, and that's for lower bandwidth communication, like control traffic, being able to control traffic. And um, this diagram on the right tries to kind of show how you can look at a slot profile in Vita 65 and then picture that, what it looks like in, the, in an actual system. And so, like we showed in Vita 46, you have these Vita 46 defined connectors. And when you look at a slot profile, it's really saying which pins, which wafers does these data planes, these control planes, these different planes go to. So if you look at the connector, you see at the bottom this large gray block and that's saying there's some type of optical coax aperture. So then if you look at what it looks like in a system, you see a block of coax, right? And then it also says there's two blocks of expansion plane, which is blue. So if you look, you see there's these bottom wafers, those are defined where the expansion plane will go. And so you can really, after dealing with it for a little while, you start to see what that would look like in your system, just based on the slot profile. But as you can tell from here, um, what you don't know is what the actual protocols are at this point. And so um, Vita 65.0, Vita 65.1, what they also define are module profiles, and that can be seen down in the bottom table. Essentially, when you see the different colors in the different planes, you can think of uh, the data plane, which is the yellow. Um, currently in the standard, it's up to 40 gig base KR4, but the, there's actually soon to be released 100 gigabyte KR4 in the next revisions of these standards. Uh, same with expansion plane, it's currently Gen 3, but they're going to release Gen 4. And, those, um, and then control plane, it's currently up to 10G, but it's there are profiles that are supporting 25 uh, base KR. So just having the slot profile, all it does is say these data planes go on these specific pins, but what it doesn't say is what the protocols are, and that's what the module profiles are for. So the module profiles are essentially a table listing the different planes. So you'll see in the top um, row, you'll see data plane, expansion plane, and control plane, which like says uh, EP, CP. And then if you go under that, you see the actual profile. I mean, the actual protocol that's used. For instance, data plane one, if you pick the first profile, you use 10G based KX4. So now you know that the pins defined for data plane one, which would be the top yellow block, are your uh, Ethernet, your 10G Ethernet. And so with a combined between the module profile and the slot profile, you now have a fully defined interface between the back plane and the module. And so open VPX, the tier two, with the host tier two, what it defines are a bunch of requirements on these different modules, and there's a module hierarchy. This allows the tier two to have very high level requirements to uh, apply to all host modules, while also having separate requirements for individual module types. For instance, if you, if you see a requirement that says a host VPX module shall do something that only applies to the host peripherals, host payloads, and host switches, while that wouldn't apply to your mezzanine type modules or your power supply modules. But if a requirement is for all host modules, such as potentially all host modules need to support chassis management, then you know, that would apply to every module there and make sure that that is encapsulated in all the different module types. So talking about modules, uh, we'll get down to the details of which type of modules are available, what are the interfaces available within host that you can leverage for your system, and also it kind of shows the evolution uh, from the early versions of host till now. So if you actually look on the right hand side, you'll see two profiles with these white blocks, and those white blocks are called user defined pins, and that means there's actually Within the interface, there's no definition for what those pins can be. And clearly that can create some type of vendor lock. But early on in the host uh, evolution, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of or as much support as there is now from vendors. And so really we had to keep it somewhat open um, 
because there wasn't great collaboration going on. But as it's evolved, as the standards have evolved, and as SOSA and more um, people have become involved in the system, we've actually been able to fully define profiles so that every pin is now defined in exactly what protocol it should be. And so that's why some of these are marked deprecated. They do support some legacy platforms. And actually using a tier three, which we'll go in later, uh, we solve for some of the issues of interoperability. But we're definitely pushing for use of such as the 14.2.16 profile, because that's a fully defined profile. So new systems should leverage profile like that. And what those top two allow are like single board computer type profiles. And then the bottom left and bottom middle are more RF payload based. So some kind of a RF processing type modules. Um, if you take a look, you can notice a subtle difference between them is how many expansion planes. So potentially you might need a little more high bandwidth. You would use the 14.6.13. And if you needed more RF or less bandwidth, you could leverage the 14.6.11. And the standards mar um, help you by saying which is a preferred profile and help the system integrator or the program office make sure those preferred profiles are being used. Uh, all your modules need to be able to communicate with each other. So there's also switches. And similarly, um, there are some that were, have less definition early on in the host architecture to support some of the legacy platforms uh, that had, or some of the early adopters, and that would be on the left. But now the top two are the main kind of Ethernet switches within the host and also SOSA standards. And so those would be what you'd want to leverage in your new acquisition. And then if you have more RF or fiber communication that's needed, could leverage one of the bottom two switches as well. And it really, so it gives some flexibility to the needs of your system, but also really down selects it from the wide number of available uh, switch interfaces that you'd see in OpenVPX. There's also some special, more special modules, such as a timing, which you can see on the left, that allows for distributing clocks. So you could have a single clock coming into your system and then distribute it to all your RF payloads to do um, sampling, that type of thing. And then something I kind of want to go into a little more detail are these peripheral profiles, we call them. So as you notice, there's a lot of user-defined pins on these peripheral profiles, but they have a very specific use. And what they can do is this is, if you were to have a system, a lot of times there's a, there potentially could be a lot of platform-specific discrete signals. Right? And if you route them to your payloads, like your SBC or your RF payload, that can tie that payload into your system with the system because it uses very specific system discretes. So what these are for, because generally the platform's uh, discretes don't change that often. Right? When you move to it, when you upgrade your platform, they stay the same, mostly or else you're gonna, the aircraft changes. Um, what you wanna do is route all those specific platform discretes to this peripheral style profile, which they, yes, that module with that profile might be tied to the platform, but it can now distribute all that discrete data through the network, such as the ethernet data plane to the rest of the system with, and then you know all those are defined in the other, how you get ethernet into your SBC, for instance, that's defined for you. And so you can replace the SBC while not interfacing direct, having it directly interface with discretes. So these are the special modules that are used to kind of se separate your processing capabilities with the um, external discrete, those platform specific interfaces. And then those are all 3U. So similarly, there's 6U profiles as well. Um, again, you see the evolution from the early days in the host standard to the more well-defined profiles now, the more recommended ones. Uh, 16, I mean 10.6.3 and 10.6.4, and these are for your SBCs or RF payloads. 6U has a lot more pins, so there's a lot more functionality that can fit behind these interfaces. There's switches available in the 6U form factors. And then again, there's an external I.O. peripheral module as well to use in your system. Um, so one thing we didn't touch on is power. And Vita 62 is where it really defines uh, power supplies. And what 
it does is it standardizes on the 3U and 6U power supply modules. The modules themselves look very similar to your Vita 46 module. The 3U and 6U form factor size are the same thing, but what it changes is that backplane interface. The connectors, because instead of high speed signals, we're worried about high power, and so there are different connectors, larger contacts that can handle more current. But Vita 62 defines that connector, the pins, and then the power that goes between the pins. And host further defines the specific voltage levels that go upon these pins. Uh, another thing is that interface between your modules and your chassis, and that's the cooling method defines that type of interface. And so Vita 48.0 is where the family of cooling interfaces stand, and then 48.2 is conduction cooling, and 48.4 is defined for airflow by cooling. And so by following these standards, you make sure that you build a conduction cooled module following 48.2 it'll fit into a chassis that supports conduction cooling. And same with 48.8. Right, so there are standards for that. And you've seen these gray blocks. Uh, this is a good picture of what they are. Essentially, these are defined in ANSI Vita 66 and 67, and they're called blind mate connectors. They can be both coax or fiber. And this is a good picture just to get an idea of what those look like. Um, you know, there's some that are take up an entire connector, there's some that are half connectors, but what these allow you to prevent in your system are currently, um, or before these were around, what you would do is you take, such as for RF for example, you take your coax from your front panel and you'd route it to the top side of your module, and what that does is you could potentially use a non-standard interface, right? Now this, it could be SMPM contact, it could be an RF nano contact, there's really no definition to what that could be or location. There's no defined location for that. And so what these blind mate connectors allow you to do is now take that cabling and go underneath the backplane. So underneath this backplane, it'll be a bunch of RF or fiber cables. And then within the standards, it defines the actual pinouts for these um, like locations of your coax, location, type of coax connector or fiber, for instance. And so now you can actually just unplug your module and plug in a new updated one, and as long as it follows that same Vita 67 uh, contact, it'll be able to plug right in. You don't have to disconnect cables or anything like that. And so these are all part of the profile as well. And finally, um, when you procure a module, you want to make sure it actually works in your system. It doesn't break whether, for the, whether it gets too hot or whether the vibration, it can't handle the vibration. And so there's a, a standard environmental classes that are defined, and this makes sure that when you order a component and you say a specific environmental class, you know when you receive that component it's been tested against the class. Generally in these defense systems you'll see uh, ECC3 or ECC4, which, you know, just to highlight minus 40 to 70 C for ECC3 and then ECC4 is minus 40 to 85 C. But this is to make sure that the module will actually work in the environment that your system uh, gives it. So you mentioned chassis management, and let's go into detail of how tier two enables uh, chassis management, and that's leveraging um, 46.11, so a commercial standard is leveraged, and so it's widely available and used, and this is how the hardware management for uh, host is free to 46.11. So one, it defines the actual interface for communication, and that's the IPMB. So IPMB is an I squared C bus, uh, basically, that allows the different chassis management entities, the module level or the chassis level entities, to communicate and pass data and messages between each other. It also defines the entities themselves and kind of what functionality is required of them, what messages they have to support. And so at the module level, the, ent the entity is the IPMC, or Intelligent Platform Management Controller. Some special notes is it runs on auxiliary voltage, so it runs on a different voltage than your main processing components or main payloads within your modules. Uh, it runs on completely separate hardware from those main modules, and it maintains the health and status and sensor data records for the different modules themselves. And then the aggregator the main, for the entire chassis is your chassis management controller, 
and this maintains the data for the entire chassis. It's used as a single point to get system and health information from. It can communicate with all the IPMCs and aggregate all that data so you can know how all the different modules within your system are doing, but just communicate with that chassis management controller. It also controls what the IPMCs can do, whether they can reset their board and makes those commands as well. So an example of how this could be useful in your system uh, would be some type of maybe an operating system crash, and we'll go through that. So your system will have four modules, right, two single board computers, a switch, and some power supplies. Let's say the, a single board computer, the operating system fails. Right? So the main data bus, there's no traffic. Right? It doesn't see that any, any traffic the SBC one doesn't see any traffic from the second SBC. So the SBC is wondering what's happened, and uh, so then it talk, it's able to talk to the chassis management controller and say, "Can you get data? See what's going on with the IPMC three." So it sends some data messages between each other, and the IPMC three reports that there is uh, an OS failure. All right, this is all out of band under the IPMB network not on the main data bus, all this communication. And then the chassis manager says to the payload, you need to reset yourself. You need IPMC 3, please reset the payload. And so all done out of band, the payload resets and that single board computer is back up and running. And this is independent of the software running on your main processor. This is independent of that main data bus, potentially independent of primary power even being applied. So. Yeah, so this is all done separately and that's why you'll hear it called out of band chassis management a lot of times.